another episode of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I am Stephen Katz, marriage and family therapist, and today we have something completely different than we've ever had before. We don't have shrinks on the show today, but we have <laughs> something really exciting. Tamara Moan and Lynn Young, artists, writers, teachers extraordinaire. Welcome to the show, Tamara. Welcome, Aunt Lynn. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. So, normally this is a show with therapists and shrinks, and I know about what you've both been doing uh, for many years, and uh, I can't think of anything that is more therapeutic than what the two of you do. Um, but let's, how did the two of you meet? Well, uh, Lynn and I were taking um, a class in book arts together uh -huh. at Linacona, the Honolulu Museum of Art School. And um, we have known, we've crossed paths in a number of mm -hmm. different ways, but during that class, we actually really started talking to each other about what we were passionate about. Both of us are trained as artists and both of us write. And um, at that time, actually, Lynn was considering uh, entering the graduate program in writing at UH. And, um, but both of us really liked the idea of combining art mm -hmm. and writing, and that's what we initially started talking about. And um, not only for our own work, but since we were both teachers as well, we, um, we really started getting excited about putting together a course that would incorporate both of those loves, writing and visual art. So that is the course that you call Side by Side? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lynn, can you tell us about that? Well, as Tamara said, it really is focused on that cross-pollination of ideas and approaches to making art, and then putting it all in the book form, in the handmade book form. So participants who take our class experience a variety of writing exercises, a variety of approaches to mark making or putting visual content in their book. And we spend about the first three days kind of just going through all these exercises and generating a lot of content, both visually and with text. Uh -huh. And then the last couple of days are sifting through it, sorting through it. What do you want to say? What fits together? And then how will all that fit into a handmade book? So the participant leaves with their own handmade book, has all of their own content. If we have 10 people in the class, we're going to have 10 completely different books, even though everybody's been through the same exercises. So you say a handmade book. Mm -hmm. uh, um, explain that to me. So it's made by the individual artist. It's not something that's mass produced. Uh -huh. I mean, normally the books we read have been produced by a press and assembled by machine. Um, but any kind of handmade book is one that's, well, it can be, you can produce an edition, which would be a number of similar books, but normally in our class, we're just making a one-of-a-kind book. Uh -huh. And we usually, because we have some constraints of time in our format, um, we usually use a pretty simple format to produce, and often it's, um, a version of taking a single large sheet of paper, folding it and cutting it, and and then assembling it in a way so that there's, I forget how many spreads, but about four to six spreads, mm -hmm. depending on the mm -hmm. way you do it. Um, so it's a small book. It's not, you know, novel length, <laughs> but it's, um, it's all handcrafted, and there's a lot of individuality that goes into it. And so are the, the words in the book handwritten, or are they printed in they some way? They can be. There's a number of different methods you can use for getting the verbal material in there. Um, there's hand lettering. There's computer-generated stuff that you can transfer into this book. Um, you can use something like rubber stamps or stencils, or you could even, you know, cut collage material. And it's really up to the individual how they want to do the lettering part of it. You said something about mark making. Did I hear you right, Lynn? Yeah. What is that? Um, I hesitate to say drawing because a lot of people will say, but I can't draw. And so uh -huh. if you say mark making, most people feel comfortable, which is essentially what Anybody drawing can make is. A mark. Yes, and essentially drawing is mark making. 
And that, I think, just lets it be more abstract, so people don't feel like, oh, I have to illustrate my book. I have to draw a picture of my mother and me at the kitchen table. <laughs> it's, it's not that at all. You can make a kind of mark that will give the feeling of whatever the story is about or the poem is about and not necessarily have to do realistic drawing. Yeah, because that's scary for some of us, <laughs> realistic drawing. You know, it's not going to look like what I see. Right. Yeah. Right. So what's the benefit of teaching the picture making or mark making and writing words together? Well, they're really different modes. They're, um, and I think they access different parts of our communication center. Um, and they can complement each other and enhance each other. Um, a lot of our exercises will feed off those two also. It's not just simply writing, but maybe writing about an image or writing inspired by some kind of visual stimulus. Likewise, the, the visual expression may bounce off first a piece of writing. Mm. So it's a real um, flow back and forth. And um, I, you know, it's the whole left brain, right brain thing that um, so much of science has shown is really beneficial to the way that we operate. So I see on the screen there's a picture of uh, a kid. So you work with kids? Uh, both of us have also taught with children. Uh huh. You do a lot of that, Lynn? I do a lot. Um, during the week, I'm in elementary schools throughout the island teaching visual art. And um, I've also taught creative writing to children, too. And um, I'm also a caregiver for the elderly on the weekends. So you do art with them? And I have done art with the elderly as well. So really a broad range of populations is what I work with as a teaching artist. And I remember talking to you before you mentioned that you also have recently come out with a book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have, and it's, I think it's a really good example of what we do in Side by Side. This is a handmade book, although, um, of course, in five days, which is generally what our workshops run, we're not going to do something this um, finished ambitious, and yeah. uh, this ambitious. Yeah. Um, but this is very much a visual book, um, and it's also a collection of poems. And there's photographs in here. It's visual in terms of the way it's designed and laid out. S and then it's hand-bound. So on a smaller scale, this is a lot what Side by Side is about. What's a writ, writ spick? <laughs> it says, what's my, where's my writ spick? Where's my writ spick? What's a writ spick? A Ritzpick is actually a made-up word. It's Alzheimer's speak. And um, this particular book is based on my experiences of taking care of elders with dementia or Alzheimer's. And what happens as the elderly person progresses in the disease, communication changes. And sometimes they will make up a word if they can't find the right word. So there's a poem in there in which the eld about the elderly person looking for her lipstick, uh, but she can't find that word, so she comes out with, where's my writ spick? Yeah. What I like about that is uh, it seems to validate, like, yes, it may be frustrating for somebody not to be able to find a word, but it, by using their word, mm -hmm. it's like you're saying it's OK. It is OK, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that, I guess, is part of the therapeutic aspect of art. It's like whatever comes out of your head is OK. Exactly. I mean, there is an editing process, but Tamara and I do really allow for everything to come out in those first three days of the class, really without a lot of filtering. And it's all OK. In the last couple of days, then people will start to make connections and figure out what do I really want to say and what, what images and what words that I've written fit together. But in the first three days, it really is about just being OK with whatever is surfacing in the writing, which is often very surprising for people. 
Could you read us a sample? Sure. So um, the book is divided into two parts. And the first part is stories, individual stories. And the second part really focuses on uh, how language does change for the person with Alzheimer's. So um, here's one page. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the changes is that the person with Alzheimer's may have difficulty organizing their words logically. For example, I don't need a bath. I took a bulletin yesterday at church in the sprinkling. If you need one, you can take one. You can take a bullet in my bedroom. Do you need a clean spirit? I have an extra one hanging in the closet. <laughs> so, and you know, they're, they're a combination of humorous and whimsical and I noticed there's, there's also one called Train of Thought, which is kind of talks to what you were saying before. Train of, yes, yes. Um, another, in another stage, the person with Alzheimer's may easily lose his or her train of thought. Where are we going? Going. Are we going to go? Are we going gorgeous? Are we growing, exploding, glowing, gore, gar, car, gar, garage? Are we going garaging today? What day is it? Is it Saturday? Today is a gorgeous day. Gorgeous, gorgeous, generous. Generous to a fault. Whose fault is it? Do you think I am gorgeous? So it's, you know, I'm exaggerating. This is a poem right. I've written, and I've, you know, much I exaggerated. Yeah. But that is what happens, you know, when they're crossing over words. They're saying gorgeous when they want to say generous, or generous when they want to say gorgeous, and, and the conversation can go in many different directions. We will be right back with part two of today's Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Don't touch your mouse. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. This show is so very dear to my heart. We talk with artists of various different ilk here about the process that they go through for their art. So we talk about what they're doing why they are doing it, how they do it. And it's a show that is inspiring. This is what I hear from people all the time. And a show that will teach you something, sometimes something about yourself. I hope you'll join us. The show is Center Stage. It's on Think Tech every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii with Lynn Young, Tamara Moan, and myself, Steve Katz, today. So Tamara. We just heard some words. Can you talk a little bit about the art th that you do? Yeah. Um, so I'm personally a, a painter and a sometime printmaker. Um, lately, I've been painting and drawing a lot. And um, I think one of the great things about Lynn and I is that we're also practicing artists, not only teachers, but we make our own artwork. And I think that really informs the way that we teach as well. Um, I uh, have been involved in a painting project lately that has to do with the Hokulea. Um, oh. And although I don't have any images of those works today, um, they kind of grow out of the painting I have been doing in the last year or so, which has been primarily with watercolors. Um, so it's always nice to explore some other media, too. So occasionally I take classes as well. Um, but it's been, it's been nice having my own work 
be exciting to me and mm. um, because that's what you want your students to experience as well to have content that is really engaging for them um, another kind of performance more performance oriented thing that I do is um, something called poetry in motion which um, is written work but I it's on demand so I usually if, if there's a venue I set up my little writing table with a manual typewriter and I will write poetry for people as they come up so it's a little bit par participatory I need the input of somebody coming to me and asking for a poem and then I um, produce something on the spot and I like that for the opportunity it gives me to be really fast on my feet <laughs> and improvis you know, improvisatory. So, uh, full disclosure, I'm married <laughs> to Tamara Moon. So I got to see one of the first times that Tamara did this uh, in Chinatown at a first Friday. Would you tell our audience about that man that came up and he was having trouble with his wife? Yeah, he was having some um, issues with his marriage, but he was really trying to patch things up, and he ended up telling me his a lot of his life story <laughs> before I started putting anything on paper. Um, and he mostly wanted this poem. He, he came up and he already had a bouquet of flowers that he was going to take home to his wife, and he thought this poem would be the perfect complement to that as kind of a way of um, asking her permission to start a conversation again. And um, so that was a big challenge. It was a really big challenge for me to try and encapsulate everything that he wanted. Um, but it was, it turned out great. He was very pleased with what I came up with. And um, that was very gratifying. So I, I don't usually do my artwork the same way. I don't usually, you know, set up my easel on the sidewalk and have uh -huh. people suggest topics. But um, yeah, if I remember, the, the, the man was crying. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the therapeutic yeah, aspects very much. of art. Yeah, I mean, you know, you just touched his heart, and yeah. he was going to go home. And well, I think this. I think the therapy part of it comes in when there's a true communication, mm -hmm. and that doesn't need to be on a on a you know a therapist's couch necessarily. But if two people are really communicating, and it can be nonverbal, it can be through a piece of visual artwork too, it can, it's really life-changing, can be. In the therapy world, sometimes they call that transference. Mm. Right. Um, Lynn, you've also worked with a whole range of different kind of people doing your art. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I've been in care homes, uh, small ones, where there's maybe five or six residents, uh -huh. and then gone in and worked with them uh, as a small group. And I've also done private one-on-one -on -one work with individuals. Um, both of them have been really gratifying. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that occurred to me as t you were talking, mm -hmm. Tamara, um, with your poetry in motion and doing it on demand. Um, how that gets put in the class is that we often give writing exercises that have a certain amount of time limit, like five minutes or ten minutes or three, make a list in three minutes and then have ten minutes to revise it and then another ten minutes. So it's very much um, it, there's kind of an on-demand mm -hmm. feeling about it, but what that does is it allows the person to work more intuitively. Mm -hmm. And you don't have time to really start censoring and filtering and say, I don't want to write about that or, you know. So um, I think that is what really lends itself to being therapeutic mm -hmm. because things just come up because you're, you're really working just very intuitively, letting the unconscious come through. And Tamara, I know you've also done some work with uh, people like military people? Yeah, I've done um, some work with uh, veterans who have um, come back and our uh, art has been a part of a whole menu of therapies that they've been active in. I've also worked with adults who are recovering from mental illness as well as um, disabled 
students who are more of middle age or high school age, mm -hmm. um, and some of them have severe physical disabilities. Um, and you know, in all those cases, I think allowing the students um, a space and giving them materials to express some things, it's just, you can really watch them come alive in a whole new way. And um, it's such an important tool for them that they, a lot of them in their ordinary lives don't have access to. And um, I've just, you know, for me, it's always been part of my life and always part of my language and my set of tools. But for many, many people, that's not the case. And um, I think the other component of it is um, for the instructor or whoever's facilitating the session to really um, make it clear that this is a safe space, mm. that really anything is allowed and um, that whatever they're putting on the paper is perfectly fine. And <clears throat> I think once you set up those kinds of parameters or acceptance, uh, some really amazing, intimate, very deep stuff comes out. And I think we found that in every instance mm -hmm. of our teaching side by side. It's, it's really been, you know, some big revelations um, have bubbled up to the surface. It must be very surprising for the people themselves. It can be. It can be. And it can be, it can be surprising for the group. It can be surprising for the individual. And um, I don't think we've ever had an instance where it's been negatively received. No. Um, no. It's always been a really positive development. That and must have something to do with the tone that you set in oh, the class. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Yeah. yeah. And you said you've been doing it all your life. How, how did that happen? Uh, I happen to have uh, <laughs> great parents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my mother was always herself very interested in art making, and she felt it was really important for me and my brother to have a space to do that in. So even as, you know, really small children in our house, we always had a place that was perfectly okay for us to be making a mess and working with colors. We always had supplies and, um, you know, we never got chewed out for writing on the wall, mostly because we had a stack of paper we could write on. You know, we always had, they always made that available. Was it the same for you, Lynn? Um, I did have support, maybe, but there was support in my environment. But I think a lot of it was just really coming from me and my own need to find a way to express, you know, or even relate to myself or delve into myself, whether it was visual journaling or uh, written journaling. You've been doing it forever? I've been doing some kind of art making really forever. Yeah, and I switch around a lot, but always, I've always been making art. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people like me? It's almost like a phobia, you know, I could do a stick figure, and uh, it terrifies me that, you know, I have this thing in my head I can't draw, right? Mm -hmm. What do you tell people like me? Take our class. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, boy, that was a setup, wasn't it? <laughs> we really geared this particular class side by side to any level, which mm -hmm. means no level, if that's what you feel you have. Um, and uh, the exercises that we, especially the ones we start with, really require zero skill. Mm -hmm. And we talk you through it. It's, it, it really is not as hard as anybody might think. Um, and somebody like me could come away yes. with the book? No. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, ab yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. You know, one, one of Lynn's strengths, which I'm always learning from, is she's very good at these building blocks as we go through. So each exercise builds on what's come before. And you start low. So you have, um, you know, you have basic skills. You build on those. And by the end, you have a really nice toolkit to work with. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like fun. An example of that could be, like, with drawing, we don't just start with like, okay, here's something, draw it, you know. <laughs> it's like, really drawing is about paying attention. Mm. So it's, if you can really look, if you can slow down, quiet mm. yourself enough to really look 
at what is before you and pay attention, you're on your way to a, a, a wonderful drawing. But even before we start drawing, we wake up the senses because artists are alive to the world with their senses. So we'll start with a game where someone will volunteer, they'll come to the front of the room, they'll put their hands behind their back, I will put something in their hands. The rest of the class will see what it is. And that person needs to figure out what it is just through their sense of touch. Mm. So we start with something very simple like that, that, that everybody, everybody likes. Right. Oh, right. And then we might progress before we're really drawing something in front of us. I'll give them a bag with an object in it. And they'll feel, they can't see the object, uh -huh. but they'll feel the object with their hand. And they'll draw it with their other hand as they're feeling it. Oh, so there's a lot of warming up. Hold that thought, because it's time for us to take another break, and we'll come okay. back to this. Stay right there. We'll be right back with part three of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major. Okay, and that's how we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starley from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes, there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public, and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because, as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So uh, come join us. And if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> what do you say to me? Good luck. Are we there? Yes. We're live with Shrink Wrap Hawaii Part 3. So, Lynn, you were telling me how for people who have art terror, <laughs> you start really slowly with this game where you put your hand in a bag and you draw it. Mm -hmm. And then what? Oh, after that, then we'll progress to blind contour drawing, What's which that? is something that it's a basic, it's basically observational drawing, where you're, when you're going to draw, you're going to follow the contour of the person. So if I was going to draw you, I'd come down your Contour face. Contour the outside. Yeah, the outside. But also, you can go inside, too. Like if I'm coming down your face, and then I, I hit your shirt, and I go down, and then I might go up the other side uh -huh. and be on the other collar. Uh -huh. So we'll start that, but we'll start it in such a way that I'm going to draw you, and I'm never going to look at my paper. I'm not going to look at what I'm drawing. I'm going to keep my eyes on you the whole time. And then what's the picture look like? Well, it's, it's, it's often very real. It's very genuine. The proportions could be all out of whack. But what you will see is you'll see a genuine shoulder, a genuine arm, a genuine hand, not a symbol of a hand. 
not like that here's a hand right no you're gonna see that the person is paid attention come up the thumb there's a knuckle then it goes down then it comes up then it turns oh there's a crease so what you're gonna see is is the pencil is tracking what the eye sees so it's not on making a quote pretty drawing or a good or a right drawing it's really about seeing closely you know that reminds me of what you said before relates very much to the therapy world when you said it's about paying attention mm -hmm. because more and more therapists are using uh, meditation mindfulness mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is just another way of saying paying attention slow down you know mindful walking mindful mm -hmm. eating mindful talking mindful drawing yes. mm -hmm. yeah and it's about paying attention yeah. And so, no wonder it's therapeutic. Right. Because <laughs> it's accessing the same kind of stuff. It's like really being alive and in the moment mm -hmm. of what's happening, mm -hmm. what you really see, mm -hmm. not what your brain is interpreting. Exactly. And it's, yeah, it's, not all, it's not only about paying attention to the outside world, but when you slow down in that way, you can also better hear the voices inside yourself and understand what emotions you're experiencing, maybe where that's coming from. So... And does that come out on the paper? It does. It does. Perhaps more um, obviously through some of the writing exercises that we do. Yeah, talk about the writing exercises, because um, that's very scary for people, too. Right. So with writing, there's a lot of ways that, um, that we get people started slowly. One is um, to... Uh, we can make something called a word bank where we may have a visual prompt or just the world around us and make lists of words just things again that you're noticing but individual words we can talk about trying to um, use really juicy language where instead of just saying well it was a green wall say something like it was a lizard green wall mm -hmm. you know more specificity and um, from there we can work on building sentences there's um, several exercises we do one is called um, the exquisite corpse which actually grew out of a data period exercise but it's a way of collaborating with others where you each just contribute a line um, but at the end of the process you have a whole page full of lines which the various people in the room have all written a single line. But it gives you material to work from, so you don't have to invent it all from your head. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we play with how to combine those lines and phrases in new so ways. So it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to make sense in uh -huh. this case. Uh -huh. um, but it's surprising how much sense does come out of it, uh -huh. um, even though it's fairly random. Um, but it's in, we have several exercises that kind of use that notion of um, a collective. So various people in the group are contributing a small part, but then you can pick and choose to build something from that. So it's not, it doesn't all, it's, it's like looking at the blank paper. We don't have people start from a blank paper. Right, we give them tools to, to start from somewhere else and then build on that. And it sounds like it's very non-judgmental. It's very non-judgmental, and a lot of it is really quite fun. You know, yeah. um, that's another part of it, I, which I think is really important. Making a game out of it. Making a game out of it, or or doing, uh, realizing that it's enjoyable mm -hmm. and not serious and not probably permanent. Um, or if it's not permanent, it allows you to play a little bit more. Does it sometimes get serious? Oh yeah, it often takes a turn there. <laughs> People talk about their personal stories. They can. Mm -hmm. Did you want to talk about um, how much people can reveal or not reveal? Yes. Um, people can reveal as much or as little as they want. Mm -hmm. Meaning, after we do a writing exercise, we'll ask who wants to share. And mostly, people really do want to share. But if someone's writing and what's coming up is very personal, mm -hmm. there is no need to share any of it. And the same at when the book is finally made and presented. Um, 
it could be as explicit or as cryptic as the artist wants to make it. And it's just that one copy, right? And it's so that one it, copy. The person just wants to put it in his sock drawer That's, <laughs> to admire. Yeah, yeah. They can do that. It's just amazing to me that um, you could, in five days, every person comes away with a mm -hmm. unique book mm -hmm. that they've created. It's yeah. like a bucket list thing, you know. <laughs> Somebody would want to make, I, I want to write my book. Yeah. Well, you'd like to? Next week, it'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it must give an immense sense of satisfaction to people. It does, it does. And th that five-day format really allows us to build a sort of momentum, because you really, you know, and it's a very, um, because our classes are not particularly large, there's usually quite a lot of camaraderie that builds up. Because you're, you know, you're working at a certain intensity, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, relationships happen when, when that's going on, and, um, and the work just kind of starts rolling along of its own accord as well. How often do you give this class, the side-by-side -side class? Um, sort of regularly, but not predictably. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh, we've, we've generally taught it about once a year. Uh, some years it's been twice a year, mm -hmm. um, and uh, most often we've taught it at the Honolulu Museum School of Art, mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've taught in a few other venues, and we're working on a future venue, which would be um, a residential venue on the north shore of Oahu, um, where people would come stay for a week, and so they could be staying and working in the same place. We would, um, in that venue, try to really incorporate the setting so um, because it's a beautiful beautiful spot um, so that's something that's in the works for the future so they'll, they'll be like really intense I imagine uh -huh. yeah right they're living with each other for right. a week right yeah. right wow that sounds like fun yeah I yeah. think it would be so uh, is this like a dream come true <laughs> I mean, you know, both of you seem to be, your lives are filled with doing what you like to do. This I mean, is true. It's pretty, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty great. It yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah. And you seem to have this uh, lucky accident or whatever of finding a person that you work well with. Yeah. And, um, how do you, how, does one person take the writing and the other the art, or how, how does it work? We both do both, mm -hmm. because we both, we both are visual artists and we're both writers. So we both teach both aspects. At the same time, or do you take turns? We take turns. Take turns. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, common, usually we'll split up the day into, like if the, the day is, um, might start with writing, one of us will teach the writing, and in the afternoon, it'll switch to visual work, and the other person will become the leader of the visual exercise. So we, we take turns, and um, for us, it's nice because one of us will be the lead teacher, and the other one is the assistant, mm -hmm. and then we'll flip those roles. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice. It's nice both ways. It's nice to be the lead because you can kind of call the shots, and you can direct the direction of the group. But it's nice to be the assistant, too, because um, you, it's just, you know, it's very nice to be in the helping role, and you don't have the responsibility. You can also, we usually try to participate to some degree ourselves, and mm. it's nice to have an opportunity. Do you to get to come away with a book? We can. Sometimes we do. Sometimes uh. we finish our book later. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I think I finish mine later because we're so kind of focused on facilitating. But we do do the writing exercises. Yeah. I love to do Tamara's writing exercises. Mm -hmm. Who came up with this idea? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're finally, we're speechless. Yeah. <laughs> I think it just kind of ha happened. happened. We were in the room, and I think I mentioned that I was, I had, I was at this point in graduate school, and I was putting together a syllabus for one of my pro class projects. And Tamara said, you know, would you consider teaching it with someone else, like me? <laughs> 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 and, 
And so I was like, like a marriage proposal. Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's funny. I was just went to this workshop on couples and working with couples, and the man said, if you ask them about the problem, they all, you know, they'll give you their usual routine. But if you ask them, you know, how did you choose each other? It's like a magical, mystical mm -hmm. thing. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It just seemed right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is what I'm, I'm hearing. And it's just working, just talking to the two of you here. If I think if somebody would just tune into this and they were to try to guess who the leader is, they would be clueless. Right. Which is really nice. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. You both can do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really. I mean, I always feel supported by Lynn. It's really a lot of teamwork. And uh, when we first invented the class, we spent a lot of time on the planning. And I think that's where we really got to know each other so uh -huh. well. In the planning. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, it's time for us to wrap up another shrink wrap. Thank you, Tamara Moan, Lynn Young. Thank you, Steve. And uh, join them for Side by Side. And thank you for joining me again for another wonderful episode of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>